It's not that I dropped my phone. Let me see if I can find it. Let's see. It's around here. Very good, science jokers. Some time ago, I made a video where I explained how commercial airplane engines work. For instance, the engine of a Boeing 737, an Airbus 320, etc. A few weeks ago, I made a video explaining how the engines of small commercial aviation planes work. Well, I'll leave it here for you. For example, the ATR, which I was actually on in the summer of 2018. I went on a trip and enjoyed it more than I expected. In case someone is a bit lost, fighter jets are planes like these examples, and what they want is to have a lot of maneuverability to... For example, in the case that a plane comes over Spanish territory, an F-18 or a Eurofighter would go out. Let's check that plane and see if it's armed. In the worst and most extreme case, if the plane doesn't respond after being contacted, it would be shot down. So, the fighter jets need to have engines that give them incredible acceleration so they can reach amazing speeds and get there in time. So that, in the case that the plane entering the territory is an enemy or armed plane or anything like that, you have enough time to get there and shoot it down, that's the point. So what's the difference between a commercial airplane engine, like this one, and a fighter jet engine, like this one? I would say that the main difference between fighter jet engines and commercial airplane engines, aside from the size of course, is the afterburner. Fighter jet engines have what's known as an afterburner. Well, just in case someone doesn't know what an afterburner is. Uh, it's an additional combustion chamber that you add to your engine after the turbine, which is big, very big, really, really big. And what you want to do there is mix the air coming out of the turbine with more fuel, ignite it, and make it shoot out the back at an incredible speed. It propels you forward at an incredible speed. And you can't even imagine it. I mean, really, if you haven't experienced it, you just can't imagine it. What does an afterburner sound like? It's music to my ears. In the previous video, we explained how airplane engines work, which I'll leave for you here. We said that the air has to be compressed before it reaches the combustion chamber. That is, the air enters the engine, gets compressed, reaches the combustion chamber, explodes, and exits out the back. As it exits, it spins a turbine that turns the compressor at the front. And it's a self-sustaining cycle, so to speak. Have you ever wondered why they want to compress the air before the combustion chamber? I'll answer that at the end of the video because it's not an easy question to answer. Actually, I only found out a couple of months ago, so I'll let you ponder it in the meantime. Old fighter jets use turbojet engines. This means that all the air enters the engine, passing through the compressor, combustion chamber, and turbine. And then it all exits through the nozzle. Modern fighter jet engines split the air into two streams for increased efficiency, unlike older designs. The air that enters inside the engine, like before, goes through the compressor, through the combustion chamber, through the turbine, and then exits through the nozzle. But there's also a part of the air that simply gets accelerated by the first fan, that is, what you can see. Looking at an engine from the front, it appears like a fan. The small fan accelerates it directly to the back, bypassing the engine's interior. Naturally, the air, having only been accelerated by the first fan stage, won't travel very quickly to the back. But that's the key to everything, and I'll explain it to you now. Fighter jet engines are actually quite similar to commercial airplane engines, where for example here we can see that there's a part of the air that's simply being accelerated and goes straight to the back. And then there's another part of the air that's in the middle which does go through the engine. Well, in fighter jets, it's exactly the same. I'm going to explain to you why this is much more efficient than what was done in the past. We have to make use of what is known as linear momentum. Don't get scared now, because we're going to have to use some equations, but actually, there are some animations where you'll be able to understand it perfectly. In case any mathematical engineer, physicist, computer scientist, or anyone else is watching this video, let's get started. I'll omit the units to focus solely on the concept, not whether it's meters per second or kilometers per hour. So that everyone can understand it, we know that linear momentum is equal to mass multiplied by velocity. Let's leave that equation there, so it's clear. Now we have a plane that's pushing air backward. Let's pause the image at a certain moment and zoom in to see what's happening. 
The air at this moment is moving backward, and let's suppose we're pushing 3 kilograms of air at a speed of 8 meters per second. This will result in a linear momentum of 24, based on Newton's third law as we're pushing air backward. With a linear momentum of 24, we're going to receive a linear momentum of 24, but forward. This is the classic action reaction, that's why if we add the forces, they cancel each other out, so let's see what happens with this linear momentum of 24. At what speed will our plane move if we assume our plane weighs 6 kilos? Well, by solving a classic equation. We will get a speed of 4 meters per second. So, if our plane is throwing 3 kilos of air at a speed of 8 meters per second, we will get our 6 kilo plane to move forward at a speed of 4 meters per second. Alright, once we have understood linear momentum, now let's look at the key to success. Let's suppose that now we are throwing air with a linear momentum of 48. Suppose the mass of our F-22 plane is about 6 kilograms as previously stated. With the linear momentum and plane's weight, we can calculate the speed at which the plane will move forward. This is about 8 meters per second as long as our plane is pushing air backward. With a linear momentum of 48, our plane will move at a speed of 8 meters per second. This is crucial. Hmm. And now here comes the key point. We have several ways to achieve a linear momentum of 48. The first way is to throw a lot of air at a low speed, such as 24 kilos at 2 meters per second. This gives us a linear momentum of 48. The second option is to throw a small amount of air at high speed, such as 4 kilos at 12 meters per second. Both options will result in the plane moving forward at 8 meters per second, providing the same linear momentum. But now we must consider energy, which you likely recall from school. And the formula for energy is one half of the mass times the velocity squared. And this is the most important thing of all. With the first option where the mass is 24, applying the formula results in 24. Divided by 2, as one half requires dividing everything by 2. Now multiply by the velocity squared, since the velocity is 2 meters per second, 2 squared equals 4. So in the end, we'll have 12 times 4, which is 48. That means we're using 48 units of energy here. However, in the second option, we're also applying the formula now. We have 4 kilos divided by 2, which is 2, and multiplied by the velocity squared, that is, 12 squared, which is 144. So that gives us a result of 288. That's the energy expenditure you have with the first option and with the second. I mean, it's huge, and it's simply because velocity is squared in the energy equation. But both, both options will give you the same linear momentum. I mean, you'll end up going at the same speed, but with one, you'll use more energy than with the other. This is why commercial airplanes have massive engines. For instance, look at this photo. Because what they want is to push a lot of air, really a lot of air, backwards, but not at a very high speed, because that's the most efficient way, as we just saw. So what they're trying to do with commercial airplanes is to make engines bigger and bigger and bigger. And maybe you're wondering, why the engines? Why is it like that? Why aren't the engines huge, like 200 meters in diameter? Well, look, that's crazy, because here, limits come into play. Of the structure of the airplane, the airplane has to support the engine. It has to withstand the force that the engine is exerting on it. Otherwise, the wing will break. So, they're trying to make the engines bigger within the structural and aerodynamic limits. Because the engine, being so big, also creates a certain amount of drag. But nevertheless, fighter jets, as you can see in this image, for example. The plane has the engines inside the aircraft, and well, if the engine is inside that plane, what does that mean? It's not very big either, it doesn't have a large diameter, like this engine, for example, which is huge, and that's absolutely true, but it's still a turbofan. A part of the air goes through the engine, while a small portion doesn't go through it. Because what fighter jets want isn't efficiency, what they want is performance. I mean, what they want is maneuverability, to be able to go fast and... Go faster or climb like rockets to meet fighter jet requirements. As I said at the beginning, and that's where the afterburner comes into play. Of course, based on what I just explained to you, you might think, well, but if what the afterburner does is, after the turbine, mix the air with fuel again and ignite it, that's gonna make the air shoot out the back really fast. 
Therefore, according to the equation you were telling us about earlier regarding energy, that's not going to be efficient at all. Fighter jets prioritize maneuverability over efficiency, and that's simply how it is. So that, in an emergency, they can go super fast and reach the target. After the afterburner, at the end we have the nozzle, but when we're using an afterburner, we need a variable nozzle to optimize the whole process so that the exit area changes depending on the power you're giving the engine, whether the afterburner is on or off, whether the afterburner is at full power or not, and so on. I'll explain this in the next video in the Shockwave series. I'll leave the link here because it's going to be an awesome video. I'll explain why convergent nozzles are sometimes used before divergent ones, causing the area to narrow and then expand. Why? Well, I'll explain that to you in the video I mentioned, which I'll leave for you here. And now let's focus on the front part of the engine, but this time we'll do it with a J79. This turbojet passes all incoming air through the compressor, combustion chamber, turbine, and out the nozzle. My friend Santi, who you likely know, will explain this part to you. He's already a classic on the channel because he knows this much better than I do. Well, here we have the J79, which has been used by many aircraft like the F104, the F4 Phantom. Uh, we can compare it with the EJ2000, which is the engine of the Eurofighter, and we can see that the size is much bigger. So there you can see a bit how, uh, with technological advances, they've managed to reduce the size of the engines because they're much more efficient. I mean, this difference in size comes from the fact that the EJ200 is a turbofan, as I was saying before, while the J79 is a turbojet. So since it's less efficient, it has to be bigger. Now here in the inlet, we have something very interesting that everyone would say, hey, is this the fan? Why doesn't it move? Or this or that, isn't this the fan? The beginning shows the structural part. This can get very cold because it's at the air intake with very cold air at high altitude, so it has to be cooled. What is done is through these pipes that come here, which I think are these. The pipes come from behind and hot air from the combustion is taken, some hot air, and it is passed through these pipes. Behind this, we don't have the fan. Maybe someone comes and says, that's the fan, why isn't it spinning? Isn't it the fan? Would the fan still be behind? This would be the variable inlet guide band, and I said variable, why? This particular one is variable, unlike many others. What does it mean for it to be variable? Well, it means that at low speeds or at different speeds, it can change its angle, and by changing its angle, it will improve efficiency. You need it when, for example, you're going to take off or when you're going to land, that usually changes. Well, now I'm going to answer you. Why is it necessary to compress the air before the combustion chamber? This is essential in engines. And the answer is that if you don't, you'll compress the air and suddenly you'll explode inside the combustion chamber, the air with the fuel. The air, instead of going out the back, would go out to both sides, and of course, that can't happen to you. In fact, there's something known as a compressor stall, which is basically when the engine, for whatever reason, which I don't want to explain right now because it's a bit complicated, the engine's compressor stops working so the air is no longer compressed, which is visible from the outside. The passengers can see a burst of flame coming out forward. Because of what I'm telling you, in the combustion chamber, the air would come out both ways. And this is something really bad, I mean, a compressor stall is one of the worst things that can happen to you. So the highly compressed air acts like a wall, where when you ignite the air with the fuel, it can't go out that way because it's like hitting a wall. Well, Yankee, I hope I've answered a lot of your questions. If you have any more, please leave them in the comments and I'll try to answer them for you. To see more similar videos and support this channel, click the link to easily subscribe. And I'll leave you a video here where I explain why farts follow you. Yes, I'm not joking. I'll leave it here for you. If you want to watch it, you know what to do. So, Yankee, you know, science lead.